taking uh, about 30 seconds for it to do it. Okay. All right, it should be okay there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and start the webinar. All right, uh, welcome to another Zoom panel series as part of the Society of Armenian Studies Zoom panel series. Uh, uh, the panel is co-sponsored by the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. I would like to, uh, first of all, thank Barlo Dermagordichan from SAS for putting together the Zoom, all the technical issues, and he's with us today too. And I would like to thank Mark Mamigonian, Sarah Ignatius, and Laura Yardumian for uh, co-sponsoring the event as part of Nasser and promoting the uh, uh, the uh, the promoting uh, the event. Uh, today's panel is uh, is has this. We have distinguished panelists today, uh, experts on Armenia. The title of the panel is Transition Tremors, Armenia Two Years After the Velvet Revolution. A very Timely panel dealing with the condition of current condition of Armenia, politically, socioeconomically. It's a kind of an assessment of the Velvet Revolution. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists now, and uh, after the uh, after the event is done for the QA part, please send the questions to me privately to Bedros Dermatosian. You can see on the chat section privately to Bedros Dermatosian, so I can for, uh, forward the questions to Professor Girard Libaridian. I'm going to introduce the panelists, and then uh, Professor Girard Libaridian will take over. Our first panelist is Professor Anna Ohanian. She's a two-time Fulbright Scholar and the Richard B. Finnegan Distinguished Professor of International Relations at Stonehill College in Easton, Massachusetts. Her fifth book is a co-edited volume with Lawrence Rowers entitled titled Armenia's Velvet Revolution, Authoritarian Decline and Civil Resistance in a Multipolar World, uh, published currently just came up with IB Taurus Press. She also authored the Network Regionalism as Conflict Management at Stanford University Press and edited Russia Abroad, Driving Regional Fracture in Post-Communist Eurasia and Beyond. George, Georgetown University Press. Along with numerous academic articles, she also has contributed to Washington Post, the Foreign Policy, and Al Jazeera. As a consultant, she worked for the UN Foundation, US Agency for International Development, the State Department, and Carter Center. She's a board member of Eurasia Partnership Foundation Armenia and the Caucasus Research Center Armenia. Our second panelist is Professor Yevgenia Jenny Paturian, She's an associate professor of the political science at the University of Armenia, uh, at the American University of Armenia. Previously, she worked at the Caucasus Research Center in Armenia. She received, received her PhD in political science from Jacobs University, Bremen, Germany in 2009. Her academic interests are in the sphere of civil society, volunteering, democratization of post-communist countries and corruption. She's an author of several academic peer-reviewed publications and book chapters. Our third panelist is Professor Asbet Kochikian, who is a senior lecturer of global studies at Bentley University. His research interests include foreign policies of small and weak states, questions of identity and diasporas and regional developments in the Middle East and Eurasia. In the past eight years, Kochikian conducted field work and research in Armenia, examining the changing political landscape there by interviewing politicians, policymakers, as well as activists across the political spectrum. Our fourth speaker is Professor Armin Eishkhanian, who is an associate professor in the Department of Social Policy at the London School of Economic and Political Science, LSE. And she's the executive director of the Atlantic Fellows 
for social and economic equity program at the International Inequalities Institute, LSE. Her research examines how civil society organization and social movements engage in policy process and transformative politics. Professor Ishanyan is the co-convener of the Politics of Inequality Research Program based at LSE's International Inequalities Institute. The research program explores the practices of resistance, mobilization, and contestation against inequalities from a global perspective. Armine is the author of the books, Democracy, Building, and Civil Society in Post-Soviet Armenia, published by Routledge Press in 2008, and The Big Society Debate, A New Agenda for Social Welfare, published in 2012, as well as numerous academic articles. Last but not least, our moderator today is Professor Girard Libaridian, who retired in 2012 uh, from University of M Michigan and Arbor. He held the Alex Manugian Chair in Modern Armenian History from 2001-2012 and was the director of the Armenian Studies Program between the years 2007 and 2012. Dr. Glibaridian was a co-founder of the Zorian Institute for Contemporary Armenian Research and Documentation in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and its director from the years 1982-1990. He also served as the director of the Armenian Revolutionary Archives in Watertown between the years 1982 to 1988, and he's the editor, he was the editor of the Armenian Review between the years 1983 to 1988. From 1991 to 1997, he served as advisor and then senior advisor to the first president of Armenia, Levon Bedrosian, as well as the first deputy minister of foreign affairs of the newly independent republic. Professor Libaridian is the author and editor of a number of works and has published extensively and lectured extensively and internationally on modern and contemporary Armenian history and politics. Currently, he resides in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is currently working on a number of book projects. Uh, the floor is yours, Professor Libaridian, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bedros, and thank you, uh, Barlow, and the Society for Army Studies for <clears throat> uh, thinking of this topic and uh, putting together an excellent panel. Uh, I'll make a few uh, introductory comments and then uh, go to uh, our speakers. Uh, in assessing contemporary events, um, we may want to think of our assessments as tentative for two reasons. Number one is that it, when it's contemporary and we are eyewitnesses almost, uh, sometimes uh, we will be missing the long-term impact of events uh, the trends may not be very clear, uh, or uh, the impact of the revolution may be very slow to reveal itself. The second, of course, is that uh, uh, so much has been now uh, distorted uh, or hidden or unrevealed because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So we don't know what would have happened if it, we uh, did not uh, have this pandemic. Nonetheless, we've had two years of the, uh, of the Pashinyan administration, and it seems to me that uh, it is possible to see patterns, to see uh, development, and two years is enough for the honeymoon to have been over and, uh, and to have um, some clear uh, signals as to where we were going. Now, as Bedro said, we have four speakers who will uh, present um, who will cover very important topics, the democratic transition in a global context, state capacity building, covering three branches of the government, changes in the political landscape and changes in how civil society behaves. This means that there are some areas that are not covered or will be covered tangentially by the speakers, such as the economy, the monopolies, investment, taxation, small business, uh, uh, and if there are any sectors that are driving uh, the economy now uh, instead of uh, what we had before. The corruption issue, I suspect, will come up, and that's very important. The education, safety net, demographic processes, 
Uh, these may still come up. In my view, though, the most important uh, issue is um, the Garapa conflict and uh, the foreign policy issues related to that, but I'll comment on those a little later. Now, what I'd like to uh, discuss briefly is um, how do we assess a revolution? How do we assess any new administration, but certainly one that calls itself a revolution and is seen as a revolution? One could um, assess what is going on compared to what were the promises that were made by the leaders of the revolution? Uh, how close are they to uh, achieving the goals of the revolution? The second is how do you compare them with past administrations in those areas? The third would be people's expectations and people's needs. Uh, how are they being addressed? And fourthly, the perspective of the international community, which will be uh, obviously covered uh, by uh, uh, Anna uh, Ohanian uh, when we begin, uh, but uh, is an important measure because the leader of the revolution himself, uh, now Prime Minister Nigor Pashinyan, did uh, invest a lot in uh, trying to capitalize a peaceful revolution uh, to bring about more of a democracy in Armenia and how that could be sold to the international community uh, to, to get more aid, to get more acceptance, uh, etc. So uh, these are my initial comments. Uh, we will uh, have the four speakers and uh, each will have 15 minutes to speak. We will uh, do them uh, consecutively and then as uh, I may have uh, some questions, comments, and then we will go to the question and answer period. Our first speaker will be Anna Ohanian, and she will address the, uh, uh, the, the title of her talk is Velvet is not a color, Armenia's democratic transition in a global context. Anna. Thank you very much, uh, Jirait. And, um big thanks to Petros and uh, Barlow for putting this together. And it's wonderful to be in amongst this group of top-notch academics and scholars as uh, this is really moving, the Velvet Revolution is a moving target. And it's wonderful to, for all of us to put our heads together to make sure that Armenia stays on the right side of the history. Um, with that, um, I will, uh, I, I have, um, only a few slides and I will not be going over them. I apologize, some of them have too much text. Those are more for myself uh, than for you. So you don't have to necessarily read every single thing, um, but let me try to share it and I will uh, take it, uh, let's see. Oh, here it is. Uh, now share, okay, very good. Um, can you, I, I'm, I'm assuming that you guys can see it. So um, I, I would, uh, following up, uh, actually following up on the framework that um, Jirai uh, uh, Libaritian just introduced is the issue of assessment. So my, my task is to look at the global dimension of the Velvet Revolution. And in particular, this allows us as academics to use so-called comparative lens, comparative politics, comparative method of analysis, which requires us to distinguish what are the criteria that we're using in comparing, uh, in comparing in, uh, this com very complex phenomenon? But before I do that, um, I'll also with the be events in Belarus in the background, I would like to highlight that what transpired in Armenia um, is very important for uh, aspirant democratizers, reformers, as well as uh, authoritarian leaders in managing such transitions and trying to keep it peaceful. I do uh, argue that, um, the, that the, there are lessons to be learned from, uh, uh, from the Armenian case, but again, the contexts are also very different uh, between, for example, Belarus and Armenia, and we'll get to it. So uh, to simply said, the world is in trouble. Uh, there are democratic declines worldwide varying degrees in various regions. And Armenia's Velvet Revolution really was a, a step, uh, was, was cutting in the opposite direction. So I do argue that the world is in trouble, Armenia can help, 
and um, to also um, share the screen here for this newly published book on the Armenian Revolution, which I co-edited with Lawrence Growers of Chatham House. And actually Jenny Paturian has a wonderful chapter in it. Um, the, I invite you to take a closer look, but this is a table of content, content, uh, contents on the right, um, which includes uh, uh, some top-notch scholars. We have Mikhail Zolian, uh, we have uh, Jonathan Pinckney, uh, we have uh, pa pa Pavel Bayev, uh, Christine Kavutian and uh, Tamar Shirinian, and I'm probably, I hope I'm not missing anyone, but all of these chapters tackle various aspects of the Velvet Revolution. Uh, so we try to be as comprehensive as possible. Now, going back to as to why the world is in trouble. So several specific challenges that currently are uh, transpiring in, in the background of declining democratization. The first one is that so-called the friendly dictators problem, meaning that um, in academia, as well as in the policy world, uh, there is not a whole a lot of understanding as to how to exit from soft authoritarian systems. And Armenia was one, Belarus is not. Um, so how to make that transition, some of the, the, it's a broad spectrum. On the one hand, we have had cases of transition through the ballot box as in Ghana, or you have completely securitized, very violent transitions that degenerate into civil wars as you have several countries in the Middle East. So Armenian Velvet Revolution offered a third path uh, which applied mass scale, peaceful, non-violent disobedience campaign applied in a very targeted way, but it was also done in an institutional pathway within the structures of the statehood, which scholars are realizing that the statehood is an important variable to manage effective transitions. The second challenge that the world is facing is the day after removing dictators easier than establishing a democratic government. How to capture the political gains from the protest movements into institutional outcomes. So Armenian uh, transition uh, also was very important here uh, because again, it demonstrates the importance of the institutions um, and here, uh, uh, the, the, the gap between protest movements on the ground and governance uh, the day after is the challenge. The third one, do no harm. This is directed more towards the, the quote unquote, the West um, established industrialized democracies who are also the donor community constitute the, have been supporting much of the Western, democ much of the democracy promotion projects, what I call so-called golden age of democracy promotion in the post-Cold War period. And lastly, we're entering into this process of multipolarity where the Western support to democracy is declining for better or for worse. And the, the agency of the people, the people power, the, the role of the states uh, in managing, growing their own uh, democratization processes in very unhospitable environments is the challenge. So from Armenia with love, a little James Bond um, for some of the younger <laughs> viewers, is there an Armenian model? Um, I argue yes and no, uh, but I also point out that they are there are liabilities from the Armenian model. So uh, this is probably, I'm not gonna be able to cover all of this. So I'm going to simply touch on each of these themes. This is simply, um, this is from the Freedom House. It documents the decline. This is the 14 years in a row. Uh, Freedom House has been, which is a non-governmental, non-partisan advocacy organization that is uh, monitoring and assessing democratic transitions and declines around the world is registering. Uh, you can see the number of countries that have experienced uh, democratic transitions that moved in the right direction. And these are countries that experience democratic declines. Um, and this is a kind of provides this on the, on the map and we can challenge the methodology, but perhaps not now. Uh, so the COVID, few words on the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID pandemic deepened this trend that already started. Under the cover of fighting the pandemic, um, some leaders actually expanded uh, their executive power without a con an accountability and without any time limits on such overreach and under cover of the, fight of the fighting of the pandemic. 
uh, Orban in Hungary and Duterte in Philippines are particularly uh, particularly standing out, but also in Bangladesh, Belarus, Cambodia, China, Egypt, and you, you see that. And of course, here you have Thailand, Turkey, uh, uh, Russia as well, which is not here. Democracies that have uh, lately come under assault, such as Brazil, India, and Poland, have seen populist leaders or ruling parties seize on the crisis to remove checks on their power to weaken uh, their opposition. Now, a few awards on. Um, I will mean, um, uh, uh, Let me just say one, uh, two sentences on this the do no harm, the international factors. From the theoretical perspective, um, there has been a Eurocentric bias. Uh, and Armenia usually would have been lumped uh, with the post Soviet group of democratic transitions and uh, the uh, being farther from Europe, it always was viewed as a case that did not have as many chances of democratic breakthrough um, because its linkage with Europe was limited. It was also culturally deterministic. Some scholars argued that, oh, the culture is too clientelistic. There are these pyramid systems that make it difficult uh, to democratize. But the Velvet uh, Revolution showed that these pyramid systems are house of cards and that the collapse can collapse actually quite easily. Um, Armenian revolution also uh, relative to uh, other uh, cases demonstrates um, that uh, uh, the securitization, how do this transit in post-communist environment where geopolitical rivalry is very strong, uh, how uh, Armenia actually is credited, the Velvet Revolution is credited for the movement leaders managing the transition by keeping their uh, external allies at bay. So uh, is there an Armenian model? As I've argued in my writing in this chapter, as well as uh, in, in other pieces, uh, in other uh, pieces as well, uh, Armenia, I have argued, is, uh, does have so-called Latin flavor. It mimicked, it's very similar structurally. Um, it's very similar to civic-based uh, bottom-up uh, human right, kind of driven by human rights concerns, pacted transitions that were characteristic some of the countries in Latin America when they were coming out of their very deep authoritarian periods. Um, and as a, um, a so in that move, the, the role of move, women in particular was also critical. It also was similar to Latin American transitions because it it had uh, the movement was very diverse with women that uh, represented quite extensively, which essentially in this respect, Armenia was not uh, an exception in the post-Soviet world where many women were pushed out of the formal political institutions from the parliament and they moved into the civil society and civil societies where the magic happened. So the women were the Trojan horse for the Republican party, I would argue. So uh, now let's, I, I also uh, do think that there is something to this Armenian model uh, that uh, number one, it was a case of democratizing in Kremlin's authoritarian orbit. Uh, number two, it was very specific uh, in terms of combining people power, but you applying it in a, within a flawed constitutional order. So there are these dual tracks of the transition. Um, and it also demonstrated how to shield democracy to prevent it from becoming a security threat. The democratic dia the, the, with Georgia, having Georgia in the neighborhood also uh, uh, played a role. Um, now, the few takeaways. So in terms of Armenian uh, model is instructive for many aspirant democracies around the world uh, because of its exit strategies. It shows that saving democracy is a bottom-up process civic participation matters. Um, number two, working within state institutions is important. And number three, managing the allies, how to tame your dragon, how to tame your authoritarian um, uh, uh, alliances that can complicate things. It doesn't, I'll conclude with this, um, uh, it does, the Armenian model does have liabilities, uh, authoritarian reserves. Um, this refers to, 
uh, residual spaces, institutions and networks still operating by the rules of the pre previous regime. Authoritarian decline has not been terminal and the peaceful transition of power within legislative and executive branches should not lull reformers into complacency. So by working within the flowed constitutional order, within the state structures, and really compromising and bargaining to a certain extent helped in keeping the movement stable and peaceful, but it also created, carried over these authoritarian reserves. Um, uh, in terms of the, so yes, yeah, shielding the, let me say a few words about the managing, uh, managing Russia, transitioning in uh, and, uh, Russia's authoritarian orbit. Um, so Armenian model allowed the uh, movement leaders to shield the democratic projects from illiberal allies. It provided political stability for democratization. However, uh, my early research indicates that this still dilutes the velvet impact regionally. So Armenian revolution broke out in a, what I call, what I've wrote about in a fractured regional fabric in South Caucasus, which complicates the effective management of both of all of these risks. As such, there are fractured regions are populated by states that have internal political fault lines and usually weak statehoods that can be manipulated externally by illiberal, uh, illiberal or even liberal uh, powers. Um, enough, as uh, Jirai Labaridian mentioned, the unfolding security dynamics in Armenia's rivalry with Azerbaijan, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is another major risk factor. I will stop here uh, because I probably don't have uh, much time and um, I will hand this over back to Jirai. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. You had one minute to spare. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, is Jenny with us? Uh, Jenny Badurian? Oh, uh, she's next. I don't see her. Right, I'm right here. Oh, okay. Uh, Jenny will uh, discuss the, the state capacity building and uh, institutions, the changing role of the legislative, executive, and judicial uh, branches. Uh, thank you, Jenny. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Thanks for um, inviting me to join this panel. This is really exciting and I feel um, honored to represent kind of Armenian voices from Armenia. Um, yes, and I'll try to address the questions. So um, I was asked to talk about, yeah, state capacity building institutions and particularly the free branches and to address the question of separation of power and whether or not the current government is committed enough to, to this process. But because I'm a professor teaching political science introduction to my students, I'm sorry for being a stickler, but I have to start with this. The separation of power is an important concept, but it is um, uh, an American concept that is particularly crucial for presidential systems. Now in Armenia, we have transitioned to a parliamentary system and parliamentary systems are usually discussed in terms of fusion of power. And so what is it we have in Armenia? We have a really paradoxical situation to tell you the truth, because um, let's start with the executive and the legislative, right? I mean, they are both controlled by my step alliance with an overwhelming mind-blowing 70% seats in parliament and incredibly charismatic uh, revolutionary leader as a prime minister. But that, you know, so that's normal. That's what you would expect in a parliamentary system if any political party would win a majority and it would control the parliament and it would control the executive. And especially in a post-revolutionary context, of course, they've got these two branches under their complete control. What is not normal and um, somewhat worrisome to me is that the remaining 30% of the seats in the National Assembly, uh, which is, this is another irony, right? This is actually a gift 
from the previous government because it was the Republican Party who designed this constitution in a way that said at least 30% of the seats has to go to the opposition. If not for this constitutional change, my step alliance would have had more than 80%. But we have this uh, paradoxical um, gift, and I think a very positive thing and a, and a rather rare in the world settings, but a very positive constitutional provision for the parliamentary opposition. Now, is the parliamentary opposition doing a good job? Because, you know, in a parliamentary system, there is less uh, tug of war between the executive and the legislative because it's a fused system. And so parliamentary opposition needs to carry that role. And that's, again, predictably, in a post-revolutionary situation, um, I think the parliamentary opposition now is somewhat better than what we had before. So in terms of comparing with the past, as Dr. Liparadian suggested, I think there is an improvement. I think there are some more professional people, but it's not to me as a political scientist and someone who lives in Armenia, I want to see an even stronger opposition, an even more vocal opposition. And here comes the sad part. I want the government, because they have so much power, I want them to be more professional and more restrained. Because unfortunately, um, yes, the honeymoon is over. And what has come now is, I don't know if it's overconfidence or the, the opposite of feeling not confident enough, but they, they're not good at reacting to criticism. I mean, for God's sake, you've got both branches in your hands. You should feel a lot more safe when somebody criticizes. But for some reason, a big number of our government officials and parliamentarians react in an immature way that then, then they are criticized. And that's one of the shortcomings of the institution that, you know, as I said, on one hand, there is an improvement. It's a better opposition. On the other hand, there is this uh, don't criticize us, we're right, they're wrong, you know, this kind of like immature behavior on behalf of um, many, unfortunately, many young, particularly younger generation. I don't know if it's lack of experience or if whatever it is. So, so much for the parliament. Uh, the executive, yes, it's, it's fully controlled by the My Step Alliance and it should be. And perhaps this is what a revolutionary society needs so that there is a concentration of power that can continue and finish the reforms. Um, and is there a lack of capacity? Yes, there is a lack of capacity, of course, uh, because um, if you remember what happened, Pashinyan and his allies were a very small group, right? And then as the revolution grew, uh, more and more people joined. And in a way, of course, um, I wasn't that old in, in 19, early 1990s, but I was old enough to remember things. And as a political scientist, of course, I've then studied our history. And I have these deja vu feeling very often, very often. What is happening now, how it is reminiscent of what was happening in 1988, 9, 1991, and so on. So the Karbakh movement started with a small group of dedicated leaders. And then by 1991, 1992, when it was clear that this group has power, all kinds of um, characters just joined. You know, and some of them joined for because they believed in the cause, and some of them joined because they wanted power, fame. They saw it as an opportunity to advance their businesses. The exact same thing has happened in Armenia very fast, very fast between. May uh, 2018 and November, December 2018, within months, this uh, revolutionary group has kind of increased and all kinds of people joined and, and they are now my steppers and whatnot. And people from inside of the my step movement themselves say, yeah, well, we're not sure, but we need people. So there is a lot of uh, strange characters in the parliament where you wonder, uh, who these people are and why are they in the parliament. And the same is to an extent true with the executive, because of course the new government had to 
bring in a lot of people. They brought in a lot of young people, which I personally welcome. I much prefer unexperienced, but young, honest, dedicated to experienced crooks and corrupt characters. So it's, it's, I think it's the least of our worries. It's the least of our worries. People who have no experience, but they want to learn, they will learn. And there are many good young people in there and they're gradually learning. What is unfortunate is that some of them uh, quit. So we hear every month about one more kind of ally of Pashinyan quitting. Somebody else quit, you know, and, and, and as a political scientist, I always wonder why. Is it because they were too naive and too revolutionary and too impatient and they hit that slow moving bureaucracy, which is hard to reform? Is this why they quit? Or is it because of some internal tension and, uh, you know, disagreements within coalition and disillusionments? So that's again, if I if I try to guess, and this is a complete guess, we don't have data. Within these two months, I don't know what, what happened more. People who were in the government learned, but also a lot of people left. So there's still this instability and new people coming into the system and having to learn again. So it, it didn't really stabilize still. And there's still a lot of kind of um, moving in and out and then and new people coming in and trying to figure out the ropes. So um, now moving to the most interesting and difficult question, the third branch, the judiciary, right? And this is for me the biggest paradox of current Armenia because is the Armenian judiciary independent? What we have now is the old people in the judiciary actively resisting the new government. Now, if you are revolutionary like a Pashinyan, that's annoying, right? And this whole drama with the constitutional court and we got to make these people, people resign and they're the old bad guys. And But a para from a political science point of view, that's what I want. I want a constitutional court that is resisting the prime minister. I don't wanna be labeling people as good, bad, uh, whatnot, right? Because who decides who's good, who's bad? I want a constitutional court and the executive being somewhat against each other. And so what we have paradoxically, maybe less now, hard to say, but for the first time in Armenian history, we actually have a constitutional court that dares to oppose the prime minister. And what does the prime minister do? He says, people go block the streets, parliament draft the law, let's push them out. And for me as a political scientist, I deeply dislike that. There are many things about this revolution that I love, that I think is, is, is really great. But this one thing I deeply resent, and I don't think this is right. When a, when a politician makes a judge resign, there's something wrong about it. So the paradox is you've got the old guard in the court providing that criticism and resistance. And you've got the new democratic government committed to building a democracy, undermining the court's independence so that they can then staff it with their own people. And I wonder, and I don't like that. And so their recent appointee, someone they were willing to appoint, just recently quit the process and he's a, he's a lawyer. And so he was very diplomatic in how he framed it. But he basically said, after meeting with the My Step Alliance fraction of the parliament, he said, I can't take this job because there, we seem to have discrepancies between what they imagine the role of the judges and what I imagine the role of the judges, right? So what's behind that? Hard to say, but clearly something's wrong, right? I think this, I think this judge got a signal like you're gonna be our guy in there and he doesn't wanna be anybody's guy. And so he just, I don't know, this is just my reading of that statement. So, right, so in terms of judicial independence, this is the big question, right? How do you build judicial independence? Do you like push the old people out, bring your own people in and then step back and say, and now you're independent? 
That's what the government wants to do. And possibly that's a scenario. But I have misgivings about the scenario because I think it sets a very dangerous precedent. Because you know who knows what's going to happen in 10 years and not a government change. And then the same process, oh, we don't like those guys. We want new guys. I think the way to ensure the independent judiciary is to just let them be. And if you don't like them, well, you don't like them. But for the citizens, I think it's the best thing if the executive government watches its every step and thinks carefully about its every move because it knows it's got the constitutional court breathing down its neck. Of course, it might not be good for a revolution. Again, like it depends on what is it we hope to accomplish. Because yes, as a revolutionary government, you want that freedom. And indeed, again, back to what uh, Professor Libertian had said, you know, they made promises, they have to keep those promises, right? And they don't have that much time. So, but yeah, I think that's the paradox. So we've got, of all the times now, we've got a judiciary that's trying to push back and the executive branch that's actually trying to control the judiciary with this kind of idea of once we clean it up, then we step back. And I'm not so sure, to be honest. But I don't want to not end on a, on a negative note because I said, you know, I, there's a lot of good things about what is happening in Armenia. And of course, the biggest thing is serious change in status quo on corruption. Because a few years ago, corruption was considered part of Armenian life. Everybody does it. The miracle that this government accomplished, they accomplished it before they became a government. The miracle that the revolutionary movement accomplished is that they changed the status quo from, yeah, it's okay, everybody does it, to no, we don't do this anymore in Armenia, and it's not okay. And I think that's worth tones for me as someone who's studied corruption. So that really is the major achievement. And a, a genuine commitment to democracy in terms of elections. That's not a big achievement. We did have free and fair elections and people felt that their voice matters. And I think that's again, priceless. So it remains to be seen how this uh, tug of war between the executive and the judiciary will develop. Something definitely to watch, but um, yeah, that's probably one drawback and one big drawback and two big pluses uh, fight against corruption and free elections. And I'll stop there because my 15 minutes, I think, are up. So. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, our third uh, panelist is uh, Aspet Kochikian, and he will be discussing the reconfiguration of the political landscape. Aspet. Thank you, Jirai. Um, and um, I'm going to be building upon uh, what Jenny mentioned in many respects. Uh, I think she uh, provided a good background uh, on, as to what I'm going to be talking about. Just uh, a quick uh, note about my uh, sources and my analysis, the sources of my analysis. In the last uh, six, seven years, I've done a lot of consultancy work in Armenia as well as other places. And that gave me a lot of opportunity to interact with policymakers in various uh, in various uh, sort of uh, branches of government. Not to mention that in the last two and a half years, uh, I interviewed a, a lot of people from both the regime and afterwards about, and also uh, individuals and uh, civil society activists and so on, just to get a sense. So it, it's been overwhelming, but it also, uh, this provides me an opportunity to gather my thoughts or to clear some of the thoughts that I have and share with you some of the things. One of the first things is that there is such a thing as too much success. And I think when it comes to the analysis of the political landscape in Armenia, I think the civil contract party, not, uh, not my, my step alliance, but the civil contract party was completely shocked with the success that they had. And that, them, that put them in a disadvantage to organize the government. They were small in number, so they had to rely on individuals, especially when it comes to uh, my step alliance. And a lot of people there are individuals, are independents, even no political affiliation. And a lot of them, as Jenny mentioned, um, were uh, inexperienced. So completely different phase, which always reminds me, which one of the first thing that it reminded me of is what happened in France in 2017, when over 300 or so members uh, of the La, La Republique en Marche uh, uh, were elected into the parliament. And most of them were kids, 
literally kids. Someone was a DJ, another one was a, a sound technician and so on and so forth. But that is the nature, beautiful nature, right? And exciting nature of political change. Um, so that's one of the first things that I wanted to mention. <clears throat> and the other thing is to, to, in assessing the political uh, landscape in Armenia and in many similar countries, it's important to uh, realize or understand looking at past experiences that the political pendulum sways from one extreme to the other. All the people who, for instance, just a year prior to the revolution voted for the Republican Party, which had a supermajority as well, by the way, not a massive supermajority, but a supermajority in the parliament, ended up voting for, uh, for the uh, My Step Alliance, which makes you wonder if political allegiances or political positionings are ideologically motivated or it is just a spur of the moment issue. So um, from that perspective, one of the things that I do want to uh, touch upon, I'm not gonna go into the detailed academic work. Robert Dahl and Blondell have, have done a lot of work about oppositions. What I'm gonna try to do is provide that, paint that picture, but then also talk about the parliamentary and extra parliamentary sort of opposition. Um, one thing that, again, building upon what Jenny said, that this revolution provided was that it created a vacuum, political vacuum. Whereas up until 2018, where you knew that the state and its institutions more or less controlled all aspects of, of society, leading not absolute control, but they were uh, entrenched in the system. Um, now you have a system where basically you have newcomers who are as unwilling as they are to accept criticism, they are actually, you know, they do not have control over society. This creates a power vacuum, I think, which different political parties, both parliamentary and extra parliamentary have been eager to fill. Now, that being said, um, one of the fascinating aspects of this, uh, the current phenomenon, two years, uh, two and a half years later, is that never before has in Armenia, has Armenia witnessed a viable, strong, and a well-funded opposition, both parliamentary and extra-parliamentary. This has changed the rules of the game fundamentally. We're talking about a political party, especially the Republican Party, which had they accepted the legislative change uh, back in 2018, they would have entered the parliament because there was a proposal of lowering the threshold to 4% and they got 4.7%. So in a way they might have shot themselves in the foot, but um, they are still a very viable, uh, viable in the sense that active, uh, a political opposition uh, utilizing their uh, various resources. Here, I would like to bring a comparison with the uh, Mexican PRI party, which for over seven decades stayed in power in Mexico, and it was the government, uh, the party of the government. Uh, and when they lost in early 2000, they still had resources to be able to control uh, the various aspects of local level government. Uh, I haven't managed to do that level, a local level level of uh, uh, local research, local level research to be able to see to what extent the Republican Party uh, or uh, the, the former ru uh, ruling party uh, has still its um, sort of uh, grasp on uh, or grip on, on local government, but uh, on local level government, but I suspect that they have. They're well funded. Uh, they have a huge media uh, sort of uh, empire including everyone else. And that's another component, I think, that confuses everyone, including myself. The level of misinformation, information, fake news, and so on has been uh, unprecedented in Armenia. Some of them are targeting the government. Most of them are targeting the government. Some of them are doing so very openly. Others are uh, sort of less uh, openly, uh, but that is an issue uh, to keep in mind. And one of the analyses that I also look at the political spectrum in Armenia that makes it a bit different than other places where there is a supermajority. Uh, the, the first example that comes to my mind is uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, where he um, actually his party uh, has a supermajority in the parliament, but without viable opposition that could challenge him. But that's not the case in Armenia. So the fear of the current my step dominance could be entrenched and become stronger. I think uh, one doesn't need to worry about that that much. First of all, the composition of the people, it's, uh, some of them are opportunists maybe, others are really uh, dedicated and so on. And as Jenny mentioned, it's constantly like a revolving door in terms of who goes in, who comes out. Uh, and 
finally, in terms of uh, before going on to the uh, to the uh, sort of an overview of the opposition's uh, opposition sort of activi activities, um, one of the major issues that I see uh, with this uh, two years later is that any, any party with such a large mandate, you know, 88 seats in a parliament of 132, 67% uh, control of the parliament. Um, for a party that is that has so much power and so much, for the lack of any other word, let's call it legitimacy, as defined by people giving it, they have been, I think, uh, very hesitant to push forward for changes. Meaning, they would start anti-corruption, but they don't follow it through. They would start the legislative uh, reform, and they wouldn't uh, follow it through. It seems like um, a very um, sort of a not follow through uh, sort of policy in many respects uh, that could lead or that could uh, provide more ammunition to, uh, um, to the opposition. Now, moving on to what do we mean by opposition? It's, uh, it's fascinating to see uh, how people re-change uh, re or rebrand themselves, right? Um, in the case of Armenia, for instance, in the case of the current opposition, parliamentary opposition, from the moment of its election, prosperous party, uh, Zarukian's party, would change its name from Zarukian Alliance in 2017 to Prosperous Armenia Party again, back to that as a party, not as an alliance. Um, clearly defined itself as the legitimate opposition in the parliament. And Zarukian was a kingmaker, right? Uh, if, was it, if it wasn't for his support during 2018 parliamentary support, uh, Pashinyan would not have been uh, uh, elected as, uh, as prime minister. However, that those things change. And it was fascinating to see speaking with members of the uh, Prosperous Party uh, representatives in parliament and outside how immediately after the revolution, they were like, yes, we got rid of that oppressive regime and so on. And now basically saying the same thing uh, about the, uh, the dominance of uh, in Kyle, my step. Um, and uh, one way or another, the anti-corruption uh, sort of policies was bound to get to Zarukian. And I think Zarukian managed to uh, initially also in recent months to uh, redefine or propose or, or, or uh, propel himself as a political opposition and that any prosecution that could come his way is politically motivated. So we had that. I think the third and only three parties, uh, uh, Bright Armenia Party, which was an ally of Pashinyan, um, has uh, been trying to situate itself as revolutionary yet an opposition to the existing uh, parliament, uh, party, in my, my step party. Uh, it comes to my, the, the term that comes to my mind, which is uh, technical, but it's always funny in the UK, the opposition's official name is that Her Majesty's most loyal opposition. So they're loyal to the, uh, they're loyal to the revolution, but they are op opposition uh, to the government. <clears throat> and uh, Marukan has been expanding in recent, uh, in recent uh, months, uh, the part activities of the uh, uh, bright Armenia. Now, other than that, um, the Republican Party, as I mentioned, uh, has been uh, active, especially in the form of, of propaganda in terms of uh, PR and so on and so forth, especially the Serge Sarkisian's uh, son-in-law, who's been doing some very interesting YouTube uh, kitchen sort of discussions. But um, it's also interesting to see that individuals such as the former head of the National Security Service, uh, Van Etzian, Arthur Van Etzian, trying to form coalitions. Uh, as I said, it goes back to the fact that there's a political power vacuum that everyone is trying to uh, take advantage of. Even Vasken Manukian has been trying to, uh, who, is, uh, who hasn't been active politically, trying to fill in that gap. But uh, at the end of the day, it comes back to individuals. I think one of the fascinating things <clears throat> uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, just last week or 10 days ago, that uh, President Kocharian, former President Kocharian, who's been playing uh, musical cells, you know, going in and out of uh, prison for the last, the good part of the last two years, has given an interview. Of course, the media uh, prospect or the media was all his supporters, uh, uh, you know, uh, fifth wave, Inger uh, Ortalik uh, and uh, H2 uh, and uh, the ARF news media and so on, where he blatantly mentioned, talked about creating an alliance, seeing himself as an alternative. So here we see his comeback. He talked about a topic, a, 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 a concept called consensus minus one. 
basically arguing that everyone should come around me except Pashinyan so that we can uh, we can challenge him. Ser Sarkisyan has been very, uh, relatively quiet. Uh, as I said, um, his son-in-law has been more active in that, except that two days ago, he gave an interview probably to preempt uh, the fact that the parliamentary uh, commission that was studying the April 4th war, 2016 war, he wanted to basically preempt any kind of, a, from his perspective, misinformation that uh, comes there or that would be there. Now, one other dimension here about in this political landscape, uh, which we're seeing, again, for me as someone who studied, it's fascinating to see such a strong opposition, funded, well-funded opposition uh, in the extra parliamentary context is also the non-political groups. I don't wanna step into Armine's uh, domain, but one of the things uh, I've been witnessing a lot is uh, we're witnessing uh, quite often recently is also the rise of the civil society groups that are opposing the government be that environmental groups with Amulsar, be that uh, urban planning groups, especially related to Ferdosi Street. And here we can see that even when it comes, it was to Amulsar, some political pundits, some, especially Zarukian, before he, uh, he was indicted or there were cases against him, uh, they viewed this as an opportunity to, uh, uh, to boost their, uh, their sort of uh, street credit, sort of, by saying that we stand with them and so on and so forth. And anyone who has ever observed uh, these people, they know that they have not a single iota of interest in environmental issues. Rather, this was a political a marriage or combination of uh, political opportunism with a real uh, environmental issue. That being said, one final thought I would like to say, hopefully I didn't confuse people. I have a lot of information uh, gathered. I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, overload people. But one of the other things is the media as well. I think uh, it's disturbing to watch and follow the media landscape in Armenia, mostly because of the fact that never before we have seen so much, so many people talking at the same time, and maybe half of it is probably misinformation. But that, in a way, I also see that maybe that's also a sign that there is a media freedom. You know, uh, the situation didn't change that much in the, uh, three years ago, uh, in terms of social media, but you know the fact that you have so much, uh, so much media, um, sort of uh, misinformation or information and whatnot, it makes the situation of anal analysis quite difficult. And one final word, uh, I know my time is almost up. If not, it's if not up, is that this also reflects on the the way that Armenians living outside of Armenia. I'm not talking just about diaspora uh, in classic sense, but also Armenians who have left that follow the news and try to form their opinion about Armenia, which is quite more often than not is more negative than positive uh, in terms of towards the, the new government. So there is a lack of serious education information, uh, in which case I think the government itself has uh, had, had a role to play by um, not actively, I mean, it's not just about Facebook lives, right? The Pashinyan goes up and talks about the Facebook lives. It's about really targeted talking about explaining, these are the things we're doing. And that actually uh, could be a major uh, a card that the opposition uh, could play against the government. I hope I didn't overstep my boundaries, should I? No, you did perfectly. Thank you, Aspet. And our fourth speaker is uh, Armine Shanyan. Uh, who will discuss the changing role of civil society. Armine? Armine? Thank you very much. I just had to unmute myself. Thank you um, to Bedros for inviting me and Barlow and the Society for Armenian Studies for organizing what has been a so far very interesting panel discussion. So I'll be discussing the changing role of civil society in post-revolution Armenia. I just want to be sure everyone can see my screen. Is that, if someone can say, yeah? Okay. So what I'd like to do is to start before, in terms of where we were um, before the revolution and during the revolution. In the sense of civil society, playing an active role in the context of the revolution. If we look at um, civil society in Armenia over the past two decades since independence, state civil society relations have been very adversarial and antagonistic. 
And while that has changed to some degree, I wouldn't say it's changed entirely. And in the lead up to the um, revolution, most of the protests in the 2010s were focusing on single issues. And while they had some success, for instance, Electric Yerevan, the 100 Drum Movement and others, they weren't changing the structural or systemic issues that people were discontent with. And I would argue that those structural and systemic issues have yet to be entirely addressed or transformed. However, this was a very important school for many of the activists in the sense that their participation in the protests helped strengthen their experience and understanding of politics. And it expanded their interpersonal networks, which allowed them to have a significant role in the context of the revolution. And after the revolution, some joined government, some stood for election to the National Assembly, and some are still within government. Um, my colleagues have already mentioned the revolving door and that some who had joined it have now since left. And I think that's an important point. What I want to consider is civil society after the revolution from the perspective of opportunities, challenges, but also what Sona Manusian and I called the divergent pathways. And we discussed this in the publication, which is um, which was published in the Carnegie Endowment Report about post-protests. And what we argue is that there were two dominant pathways. One is the pathway of integration, and the other is the pathway of independence. And in writing about Armenia, it's important to think about international experience and what that tells us. And one of the things that we find is that in post-revolutionary settings, whether that was Georgia or Ukraine or even um, post-apartheid South Africa, there's always going to be the end of euphoria. There's going to be an onset of disillusionment and discontent that inevitably comes about. And after some period of time, what we also see is a resurgence of protests and dissatisfaction. And I would say in Armenia, we are beginning to see the beginnings of this, particularly around the Amulsar movement. If we think about now the paths that I mentioned, the first path is that of integration. Now, the path of integration was a path chosen by many civil society activists immediately after the revolution, in that they entered institutionalized formal politics. I have here um, photos of Lena Nazarian, who um, famously stood up to the OSCE um, observers and challenged their declaration of the 2013 elections of being free and fair and was um, rushed out of that room. And now, as we know, she's a member of parliament and a very important individual within um, the My Step Alliance and the party, um, the civil contract party. But unlike um, others, Lena continues to remain involved, whereas others who had joined, um, who had been um, very active in civil society have, have left, as, as we've argued. But the key here is that those who went into the public sector, who, those who went into institutionalized politics, there were different reasons. For some, when we did the interviews last year, it was a sense of responsibility to continue the revolution, but to, to continue making changes in a more formalized, institutionalized way. For some, inevitably, it was a career opportunity. For others, it was about you know, making a very fundamental change and when they realized that they were working within structures such as ministries that had not been transformed by the revolution, they decided to leave. Now that's one pathway. The second pathway is the pathway of what we call civil independence. And this was chosen by some activists who felt that by joining institutionalized politics, whether that was in the executive branch or in the legislative branch would curtail their independence and autonomy. So some of those whom we interviewed last year spoke about themselves as critical friends. But I would argue increasingly those critical friends are becoming pure out and out critics of, of the current government and are expressing in much more robust language their discontent with the policies of this government. 
the aim of staying outside was, um, again, the fear that if you go into institutionalized politics, you lose your ability to be independent, to be outspoken and, and critical, and to hold government to account that there will inevitably be a level of co-optation and silencing because government doesn't want to be criticized. And I think Jenny was talking about this in her um, presentation. Um, and if we think about this from an ideological perspective, after the revolution, many left-leaning activists in particular have criticized the Pashinyan regime for being very neoliberal. And they've highlighted how these policies, these social and economic policies, including the regime's flat tax, are leading to inequality and not allowing for changes, transformative and progressive changes to take place. So they consider the government's uncritical continuation of neoliberal policies as problematic. And I think, you know, as, as someone who is now working within a International Institute of Inequalities, it's interesting how there is a lack of discussion within the public realm of inequalities in Armenia, particularly when we think about not just income inequalities, but wealth inequalities. For instance, there's a global measure, a metric system of measuring wealth inequalities. And Armenia is notably missing from that. Um, and yet we know that after independence, wealth inequalities um, skyrocketed. And so it's important to think about these factors as they are related to political stability, to political discontent, and they are going to have an impact. Now, for many of the activists who took um, the second pathway, they have continued to have varying ties to uh, members of the legislature and to the members of government. And this gives them an opportunity to share their views and to criticize policy decisions in private. But increasingly, as I said, this is becoming much more public and their vocal critiques are within now the public sphere. Um, this is very important because without a viable, real opposition, not holdovers from the previous years, Armenia is going to be, have a very difficult time um, establishing and strengthening its democracy. I remember after um, the revolution, there was a party created, um, Citizens' Decision Social Democratic Party, which failed to clear the threshold and to secure any seats in the National Assembly. But there need to be parties that are across the political spectrum that are bringing new voices and platforms and mandates rather than reproducing the same old, same old of what we've seen in yesteryears. Now, of course, Armenia's revolution happened two years ago and no one could have predicted what would happen now, which is COVID. And here on this slide, I've listed a series of challenges and I've called them global and local challenges because Armenia is part of the global um, community. And I think we do need to recognize that at this period of time, what is happening locally is not devoid or disconnected to, to the global context. And obviously COVID-19 is affecting us across the globe. And I would argue that COVID is a critical juncture it can be an opportunity maker. It could be a window of opportunity where progressive changes can be introduced. We're seeing some countries, for instance, introducing universal basic income, rethinking their public health systems, rethinking their social welfare systems and so forth. But it can also be a critical juncture in terms of strengthening and um, pushing forward authoritarian forms of governance and populism. So it is, a, it is a period which is somewhat transitory, but it is going to lead to changes inevitably. Interestingly, um, there's research coming out which looks at the relationship between pandemics and protests and political instability. Um, in England, there's a research that looks at the Black Death from the 14th century and how years, um, several years after the Black Death, um, there was the Peasants' Revolt, which was the first major revolt against the aristocracy and the monarchy, which led to massive changes in the country. So I think we do have to recognize that a pandemic is not simply a public health issue, but it is obviously a political issue, as well as an economic and social issue, and to think about what the ramifications will be in Armenia. And then we have, of course, the economic recession and depression, which is going to inevitably come. 
in Armenia where the government had said that tourism would be a main um, plank or pillar of its economic policies. Well, that's now, you know, unrealistic given that no one is flying anywhere. So um, we are going to witness that in coming months in terms of unemployment and um, cuts in income and even remittances, I would argue. Of course, there's the geopolitical instability. We saw some um, fighting happening in the past weeks. Um, it seems to have died down, but there's always the threat of resumption of the Karabakh conflict. And that's always going to be an issue for Armenia and wider geopolitical instability in the region. Um, Armenia isn't necessarily in the most stable regions of the world. And then of course there's populism and mistrust in institutions. Um, on, I, I, I try not to go on Facebook just um, for my own well-being, um, but whenever I do, I always am startled to read the conspiracy theorists um, among Armenians and, and um, you know, they're not alone. And as Mishiko Kakutani talks about, we are living in a period where there is a death of truth and the rise of this mistrust is, is um, quite um, widespread. And of course, there's climate change, which is also affecting Armenia and um, the environmental activists who are active in Amulsar have also highlighted this and among other issues. So I think within this wider context, we do need to rethink and revision the role of civil society and its relationship to the state. The pathways are not mutually exclusive. There is There are porous borders between them. There is movement as we've already indicated. But it isn't what is, you know, what makes me happy, I would say, and that's, you know, in quotation marks, is that the entirety of civil society did not join government, as happened in other places, such as in South Africa, and to some extent in Georgia, that there was an, uh, a mass that stayed outside to be independent, to hold the state to account, and to continue to have that space for rethinking and discussing issues that are of crucial importance. What I'd like to end with is this point of perspective. Now, I've only changed one word in, in these two sentences, and we can either, um, from our perspective, say, it has only been two years. What do we expect? Yes, the reforms in terms of addressing corruption, in terms of prosecuting um, individuals from the former regimes, um, in terms of promoting transitional justice, in terms of advancing social and economic policies, it's only been two years. But on the flip side, we can say it has already been two years. What has been done in those two years? I think it's a matter of perspective, but it's also something for us to think about because it has been two years and it's a good time to take stock and to reflect. So thank you for your attention and I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Armine. These have been <clears throat> very, very significant contributions to our thinking and assessment of uh, the revolution, uh, the two-year-old revolution. Uh, I want to make a few comments uh, and then go to the questions. Uh, one is maybe a technical one, but a very important one. I think this revolution would not have been successful had Sarsakian behaved the way Kocharyan did. So uh, in explaining why this was successful and not others, uh, that is a very important thing. Now, there may be a variety of reasons why uh, Prime Minister, uh, President turned Prime Minister Sarsakian did not use force, which it could have. Um, and although he, benefited from the use of force on March 1st, uh, when Kocharyan was passing the baton to Serge, he benefited, he was the beneficiary. Uh, although Kocharyan did it for himself as much as anyone else. He knew that he had legal liability. He knew uh, what he had done and he knew that he could have ended up in prison just as Trump uh, thinks uh, he will end up in prison. So this is an important thing. Whatever the reasons, Serge uh, gave up power. And I think this has to be recorded. Uh, I think our speakers have a very healthy skepticism along with hopefulness, which is very important. 
that is, uh, we still do not have a final word on where things are going. I would say that we are in, in the presence of an unfinished revolution uh, in so many areas where while we can see patterns and areas of concern, we still see the possibility of change that is quantitative, qualitative change in Armenia uh, with this government. I would uh, also point to the question of the courts uh, and there will be a question on this. On my part, I would say that uh, Jenny's point is very important and she balanced her uh, criticism and concern with, uh, with understanding there's a fundamental issue. That is, um, uh, we cannot resolve that issue on the basis of a technicality. Uh, then we'll come to a question on that later. Um, the one comment on the revolutions and the fracturing of uh, people leaving the government soon after the revolution. I do not know of any revolution whose leaders at the end did not kill themselves, each other, did not eat. They, it happened with the French, with the British, with the Russian, with the Chinese, it happens everywhere. It happened with the Garapa Gomide, it happens because you succeeded. Being against something is a uniting factor. And then once you have the power, you are facing a completely new agenda. And on the solution of these agendas, you will certainly have differences. Uh, and those differences may be serious enough for some to leave. So I'm not too concerned uh, about that myself. Uh, and one uh, point about the comparison with the 1990s uh, that Jenny made, uh, I think there, there's a couple of differences between the 1990s and uh, what we see today. First of all, the leadership of the uh, revolution then was, a, uh, was made up of a group of people. That is, there were strong personalities, uh, not all 11 of the Garapa committee, but a good part of it. The, these were strong personalities. And the second tier, you had strong personalities. So that the leadership, while of course, it fractured Basken Manubian, uh, Tavit, and the others, many of them left and became opposition. You still had a strong leaders. Uh, now, what we have is basically one strong leader. And that is more of a concern to me uh, in terms of capacity uh, in decision making. The uh, second point is uh, that the while in the 90s, there was lack of capacity, there was also quite an effort to bring that capacity from the former regime and from the diaspora. Uh, and that is very important in terms of the openness of leadership in one case versus the other to advice and to participation. Here, we still uh, have a question about that. Uh, so I, I will stop here and um, maybe, Be Bedros, how much time do we have total? How long can we go? Uh, we can go another 20 minutes for Q&A because- Okay, 20 minutes, then uh, we'll do a Q&A and I'll make a couple of comment, concluding comments. Okay, first question is with regard to the constitutional courts. And the question is uh, from, uh, for Jenny and in general, whoever else wants to answer, and it's about the courts. And it is framed in the following way. Is the judiciary in Armenia corrupt? And if it is, who has the right to reform the courts? Did the revolution miss the opportunity when it first came to our power to settle this issue for once and for all. And uh, a, another version of this is, how can the constitutional court that was entrenched, was placed there by the old regime to protect itself in the future, be independent? 
That is the independence of the judiciary is not only from the government, but also from any other force that can instruct it to say this, uh, to resolve an issue this or that way. So we'll uh, go to Jenny and then others who want to question to add anything. Right, so it's a conundrum, right? And the first question is, is the court corrupt? You know, it's very easy to say that someone is corrupt or that an institution is corrupt. But I'm sorry, but A, I'm a, I'm a scientist and I need evidence. And B, I think particularly when we talk about democracy, institutions, judicial air sphere and things like that, we have to, there is one beautiful principle that is a worldwide principle. And that principle is innocent until proven guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. Is the court corrupt? As someone who lives in Armenia, probably, but can you prove it? Can we prove it? Do we have evidence beyond any reasonable doubt? Because these people who have been sacked from the constitutional court have already appealed to the European Court of Human Rights. And it's going to be interesting to see what the European Court of Human Rights will say. So, you know, and this is, yeah, I didn't even talk about the transitional justice issue, which is such a difficult thing that is just presented as, oh yeah, transitional, really? Like, who are you gonna go after? So it is indeed, who can, who can sack a judge? Who can tell a judge, you are, you have to go now. If there is evidence of the judge misbehavior, of course, but who can do that in a democratic country? In the United States, who can fire a judge? Nobody, right? The judges are appointed for life and nobody asks which government appointed this. Now, of course, in Armenia, we have a problem because we keep saying the previous corrupt government and, and yeah, the previous government had a lot of issues. But what kind of a precedent are we creating by having a political process of removal of a judge that is not based on evidence, that is not based on constitution, that is not based on, I think other judges can judge a judge. That's the judicial independence, right? That's the idea. But a, a member of the parliament I think that's how I understand separation of power. Has no business telling a judge, you go now. That's but judges can be impeached, right? So yes. parliaments have the power to dismiss judges. They can be impeached in the US. Good, but was there an impeachment? So, so uh, my- and, and let me add one more thing. And this was a conundrum, right? And as a political scientist, I also thought, who can remove a judge? And then our government came up with a solution, which I think was the right solution. At least it was a democratic solution that the Armenian people can remove the judge, right? And they proposed that for a referendum and we were supposed to have a referendum. And this would have been a solution that I would agree with because ultimately I think, yes, people should, it's a people power thing. Maybe it's kind of again in order. And unfortunately COVID-19 lockdown happened and unfortunately, our government had no patience to stick with their own solution. And so now as an Armenian citizen, I ask myself, what happened to the idea that I would get to decide? How do you propose a referendum and tell, dear Armenian people, you have to resolve the conundrum, and then you backtrack it. What's the rush with removing the constitutional judges? I don't understand. The only thing I understand is, there is a rush to put Kocharyan behind bars and they need their own constitutional court to do that because the old constitutional court obviously is not gonna put Kocharyan behind bars. And now we're back to the same question, innocent until proven guilty, beyond any reasonable doubt. What kind of precedent are we going to create with this process? Five years from now, three years from now, elections. If this government loses and the next parliament does the same, to the new constitutional court. What are we gonna do, go in circles? 
as, as the constitutional court now a political institution that is being appointed by the current political force. I find that strange, to be honest. So, and, and it's, it's it, the other situation is not good evil. So you have kind of like, which, which one is the least of the two evils? The old court or the court removed through a dubious process? And I don't think we will ever agree on this issue. I think for some, the first is the bigger evil, for some, the other. And that's why I think the idea of putting it to a referendum was a brilliant idea. And backtracking on that idea was not a good idea for me. Okay. Like Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Anna? Um, I'd like to be a devil's advocate on it. Um, I think the argument of continuity from the previous regime and the judicial isolation from the political process makes sense if the prior regime has been engaged in building constitutionalism strategically. And there are authoritarian states who have done that. On the contrary, in this case, the previous regime has used the judiciary and parliamentary institutions as democratic facades to consolidate its soft authoritarianism. Number two, I am worried that the failure in advancing judicial reform can lead to weak democratic transitions. And this has been the case in Brazil and Taiwan to continue with old courts trying to build new democracy is to pretend that the velvet was a regime change rather than a systemic breakthrough. And number three, there is enough evidence actually from Ukraine under Poroshenko. Ukraine went through a flurry of institutional reforms to strengthen the judicial independence and constitutionalism, but importantly, it also kept most of its judges in the system. Now studies show that Ukraine is a case study of a failure in judicial reform. The same in Latin America, major international organizations funded different forms of judicial reform. What is emerging is that reform-minded elite in the judiciary is an important factor. Uh, one more point, the question then is where and how to look for judicial independence. Judicial ref judiciary reform can be evaluated in terms of its efficiency Yes, independence, but also access. So uh, inputs of judicial reform. Um, what are the new institutions that are created? What is the judicial training that is carried out? What are the reformed laws? So I, I, I don't think, I do agree with your points uh, on the weakness of the party system. And I do think um, that much of the opposition, I think healthier opposition is going to emerge from the civil society as Armin had pointed out. But I think on the constitutional reform, we could criticize the Pershingian government for not moving fast enough, not being very effective. But I think politically, they cannot be criticized for trying to reform the old court. Every demo country that is undergoing democratic transition embarks on a legal transition. What's happening in our judicial transition, judicial reform. So arguing that what Pashinyan government is trying to do with the constitutional court is the same as Orban in Hungary trying to pack the court. These are apples and oranges. They are not comparable. I don't think. Oh, thank you, Anna. Uh, uh, a quick comment by Aspit. Yeah, uh, very quick. Uh, yes, they missed an opportunity. The question is that they could have done this, they could have rolled over the, the bulldozer of change with the momentum of revolution, and they could have done that, which reminds me of a, of a scene that like they were like a, a, a child in a candy store, that they went over so many things to, to change so many things, but they couldn't. The other major challenge is that the cadres, you know, you would replace the judges, but who are you going to replace them with? Armenia has a major shortage of judges, even under uh, the previous regime, uh, something that has been over and over mentioned. And uh, thirdly, also the people, for instance, David uh, Haruchunyan, uh, David Har the former uh, Minister of Justice, well, Haruchunyan, yes, uh, who is uh, highly respected even by the current government, for instance, but uh, he was too politicized to be able to do anything. People like that were also marginalized. So it's a plethora of so many things, uh, but um, that's one of the things that I uh, wanted to add. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We'll go to the next question. And that- Jira, uh, um, can I just say one very brief sure, comment sure, on this? Sure. 
just to, to add my two cents, I agree with, um, with what Anna and, and Asbed said, and I would say, you know, it's an issue of cadres here, but it's also an issue of structures and institutions. And I think this is where Armenia needs to move instead of making it a, you know, personality issue or kind of this issue of, you know, to, to PR issue. And I think there is a need for judicial accountability and independence, but we also need judicial review systems where you can hold judges to account. And I think that's what's perhaps lacking. And even in the UK, you know, there's a great deal of structures and systems where you can remove judges who are not, you know, behaving in the way that they should be behaving. So I'll just end there. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. The next question is with regard to capacity building. Uh, and the question is this, uh, given the situation, the uh, problem of professionals and uh, health bureaucracy, is Armenia learning from other countries that have had the same problem and have kind of resolved it, uh, such as Kazakhstan, Georgia, Northern Macedonia, uh, they, they had the same problem, but they've somehow uh, used methods to resolve it. And I think this would go to Jenny again. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I'm not very well informed on uh, what is the current government doing in terms of public administration reform. Um, I haven't heard anything, to be honest. I haven't heard anything major about, oh, we are working so I wouldn't know. If they are working on a serious public administration reform, I'm just in no oh. position to say so, unfortunately, because okay. I don't, I haven't heard anything big, but they might be, hopefully they are. What I do know is that right after the revolution, there's been a lot of international, um, not assistance, mm -hmm. but more like all these donors were asking, what do you want? Mm -hmm. what do you, how can we help you? Tell us how to support you. So if someone in the government was smart enough to say, help us design a public administration reform, this would have, uh, they, they might have been working on it now. But what we see in two years is indeed, you know, judiciary is a constant uh, topic, the tax reform, which Armina mentioned, but I haven't heard anything about public administration, ser serious public administration. I mean, it's this thing like they say, we have to change it, but then, it, they try to tie it into transitional justice that backfired. They, they try to resize the bureaucracy and they did to some extent, but whether there are trainings and, and serious effort, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else could, could answer that question? Does, is anyone aware of the model or the solutions found? Um, model, uh, if I may, Jirai. Um, not necessarily a model. Uh, and Jenny, when you mentioned public administration, you're talking about right? Civil service mostly, right? Uh, that was one of the in, uh, initial months, there was a lot of talks about reforming the civil service uh, uh, the law in general. But again, just like everything else, it was half-baked and uh, didn't continue. Uh, another thing about the capacity building, unfortunately, this also goes back to what I mentioned earlier is that there is, there is a duality in terms of even now, the early, early days more so, that the government or the, or the civil contract, uh, when it was uh, uh, faced with the option of choosing reliable, loyal people versus professionals, always went, if they could find both, perfect. But they always chose the reliable rather than uh, uh, rather than you know the professionals. Uh, I, I think there are serious uh, discussions about it, but at a ministerial level, in, in terms of it's not centralized in any way. But each ministry or each um, um, a branch, uh, they're trying to do that. And I will second Jenny's uh, uh, point that it's not just about the civil service reform. But at some point, some uh, one person mentioned that the international community is waiting in line with their checkbooks open asking the government and the parliament later, uh, uh, what what can we do? What do you want us to do? And like, okay, let's think. Or, you know, they would come up with grandeurs or nebular ideas. So it might be an opportunity that might have been missed, but I'm not sure it is missed yet. Anyone else on this topic? Okay, uh, maybe we can go to some uh, very brief final comments by any panelists and then I'll make my comments. Uh, 
let's see, uh, Armine, you want to start? Anything to say? At the um, I think, you know, I was looking at some of the questions and I think some people keep going back to the diaspora issue. And I think this is an important point that we didn't perhaps cover. I know I didn't cover so much in my um, presentation. And I think here it perhaps touches on the public administration point as well in terms of cadres and whether, and Jirad, you're probably better placed than any of us to talk about that, of diasporans going to serve um, you know, in Armenia in, in a public sector capacity. And I think that's something that we do need to consider and their role in the revolution is very important, but also post-revolution where there has been um, attempts, there are attempts, you know, to encourage diaspora professionals as well as investment, capital investment into the country from an economic perspective. So I would say perhaps that's something that, you know, a future panel can discuss. Um, another point that I'd like to, to, to address, I think, is, is this issue uh, that we do need to think about the short term versus the long term, because right now, Armenia is facing, you know, this crisis of, of COVID and, and, and several others, but it is going to also have to think about, you know, between the short term and the long term where it's heading. So I'll end there. But thank you for, again, the panel and all of the contributions and questions. Um, we, we do have uh, a couple of other questions that came. And one is, how can uh, it be possible in Armenia in the context of CIS uh, uh, evolution, uh, CIS countries, uh, to, to build a political party that is sizable enough on the basis of a platform rather than on the basis of a, a rich person bringing together some people. So uh, that is uh, one question. Uh, and the, sec the other one is what is necessary for the new government to do in order to succeed? Now, this is a very general question. So I'll, I'll see if uh, in your final comments, you can address this beginning uh, at this time with Jenny if you can address okay. this as well. Yeah, well, I, I wonder what should it do to succeed? That's a tough, the first one I love, that's a question I love because that's a topic we love discussing with my students. A platform, yeah, presupposes ideology and, and there are ideologies, I believe, because when you talk to people, you know, some are a bit more conservative, some are a bit more liberal and some are green and, but there is such a lack of, I don't know, knowledge, understanding. And again, our current government actually, I, I think they really believe in what they say. They sincerely say, we have no ideologies. We are technocrats and things like that. So I think we have to start, I think green platform would be a start. And indeed there was this party, I believe they'll come, I hope they'll come back. But there seems to be such a complete lack of understanding that yeah you have you, you have preferences higher taxes lower taxes more government less government these are classic things and and they they're still there but somehow we don't think in terms of ideologies or platforms yet but i think we'll get there i think we'll get there frankly 30 years of uh, development is not so much it's probably if you think about party development in Europe, probably talk about, I don't know, but 30 years doesn't, and 30 years of non-democracy, right? So the, I think the parties just didn't have a chance to form yet. And that's my hope. I think, I think the younger generation is more aware of this, uh, of this discussion, at least I hope so. So we might be seeing parties formed based on ideologies and platforms in the future. What should this government do? Boy, if I knew I would be advising the government. Um, it's a hard, it's a hard one. It's a really hard one. Um, I think, I, frankly, I mean, I've been such a critic of them. So let me come and say that I think they're doing the best they can, given the situation. Uh, so patience. Yeah, that's probably my that's probably one thing with the judiciary okay I, I know that we will never agree i hold this position and i respect the other position i just told you for some 
this is bigger evil, smaller evil. But I think they need a little bit more patience for criticism. I think that it, it doesn't hurt to get criticized. That's okay. Build character. Of, yeah, the last thing I really want to end with is this question, is it only two years or already two years? For me, it's definitely only two years. But unfortunately for our government, um, for many people, it's already two years. Yeah, so maybe that's also what they have to do. Start managing expectations because elections are only three years from, I think it's five year term, right? So the elections are gonna be upon us before they know it. And so they have to maybe start managing expectations. When there was this revolutionary euphoria, naturally things were like, yes, there is a magic wand and now we start the economic revolution. And now, so they had all these like, I think they have to backtrack now and say, people, patience. We're moving in the right direction. It's taking us time. COVID is of course a serious change, but maybe it's in a way an excuse for them now to say, and we got hit by COVID, give us a break. Yeah, Patience, patience, patience. And that's the message that they need to start getting out to the people. Thank you, Asmit. Yeah, um, quickly, I think when it comes to building parties on a platform, I think the trend, and this is one of the things I do talk about a lot uh, with my students when talking about political parties, and I use a title from The Economist a couple of years ago, an article of the title, that uh, political parties empty vessels. Uh, that's what it means. Basically arguing that there is, it's void of ideology, where this ideology is at all. Uh, uh, play a role in political parties. And I, I think the trend has been more and more to be ideologically void, uh, mostly to capture more and more people. And that was uh, proudly mentioned in uh, a civil contracts uh, uh, um, sort of meeting about a year ago, I think that we don't have isms, we don't believe in isms, we are, the, we, we are these and so on and so forth. In the context of Armenia, uh, one of the things uh, that I, will, I want to also for some final thoughts, it's about the role of diaspora or to, uh, policy towards the diaspora. Um, to rephrase some, something uh, someone had said, uh, the Velvet Revolution was the best news that the Armenian diaspora could have that had absolutely no impact in their lives. So basically it was, everyone was happy about it and so on. But to argue, I think that the current government has deconstructed uh, inter, uh, 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 relations with the diaspora, I think it would be an overestimate, mostly because of the fact that the uh, frequent, like former governments didn't have uh, a clear diaspora policy. Now one could argue, well, but there was a ministry of diaspora. Well, if it's in just a name, we can always come up with a new name as the, the universal uh, dictatorship and the emporium of diaspora Armenia relations, if that would satisfy people. But I think that is one of the biggest challenges. Um, and finally, when it comes to the ideological vacuum, the problem is that uh, there are parties that have a solid ideological or at least profess a solid ideological platform in Armenia. Um, the communists used to be, but they're completely irrelevant. The ARF, but it has only three, three and a half percent of the votes. But when it comes to, again, the vacuum that I talked about earlier, the political vacuum, if you, especially since there were, uh, there was a question about the ARF, someone had asked the question about the ARF, you know, the problem with the ARF platform is that if it's nationalist and social dem democratic, you have so many different political parties that have already occupied the national agenda. Uh, in one way or another. And also there are a lot of parties that occupy the social democratic one, especially the um, the tax law, the income tax law group. Um, um, I forget their, their name, the social uh, democratic party. I think that was, what was it called? Uh, maybe anyone from the panelists, a uh, small group, but they were quite active on social justice and so on. So again, it's so much up for grabs that um, anyone could, uh, you know, chunk takes chunk takes uh, take chunks of these uh, uh, sort of electorate. Uh, but the trend, more or less, is populism everywhere, but also lack of ideology, so that you can accommodate uh, more and more people. Sort of like the bell curve, you want to come to the middle so that you capture as many voters as possible. And I will conclude here. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, Concluding sure. remarks, answering those last two questions. Sure, um, I'll try to do it quickly. 
Um, in terms of, well, since, uh, since we're talking about the parties, um, actually we've been the book that is coming out uh, in the last chapter, we do touch on it, simply touch, in order we don't have a special chapter on it, unfortunately. However, two problems here, as the person who asked the question pointed out, indeed, the personality-based parties are uh, somewhat unique to the post-Soviet context, but there is a bigger problem, which is the global problem, which is the worldwide decline in par party memberships. So parties as institutions to translate interests from the public, uh, from the citizens to policy outcomes as such a mechanism, the parties are not working well. And this worldwide, but in Armenia that is compounded that our parties have been designed to advance the interests of the specific, uh, specific uh, clientelistic groups. So the challenge is not only who is going to occupy the, 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 the gaps that are there, and Aspet is right to point that out, but also an institutional one, where the parties on their own, and this sounds crazy, but will be able to claim their effectiveness uh, in, uh, as an instrument uh, of interest representation. Uh, and Yelk Party in particular, this actually emerged as a movement right, which is part of the problem. On the one hand, it was, it had all kinds of advantages of making the transition, but at the same time, uh, by not having that hierarchic structure of parties, uh, they did not bring in the high, large number of cadre of people who could fill in the state position. Um, I do expect, I think, um, the uh, Armine pointed out something that is of huge importance, um, that I hope our listeners can take away is the issue of inequalities not being discussed. So whether new liberal models will be effective or not, is the government too liberal or not, how much market, how much the state, I think uh, party politics will be defined along those lines. So that's huge, that, that is really critical. In regards to state building, um, keep in mind, uh, the long term, I think the vehicle of state uh, through the ballot box that the election cycle works because that is a very important, immediate, and intimate way of sending a message to the government whether the state is working or not. So that's in the long term. Um, but state building in general, looking at established democracies, if the, it takes them centuries to build their state apparatus. And I have done some work on state building in Afghanistan, the, the Kosovo and Bosnia. The Western, I think in the post-Cold War period, there was this mindset that the Westerners can go in, uh, dump some money, certain amount of money and boom, you have a strong functioning administrative state. Um, that is not going to be the scenario here. I think the key engine of state building is going to be the Armenian citizenry their interface, especially working through the judicial system, are the courts working or not? Um, all of those, is the police working or not? When I'm in Armenia, I make it a habit. Every single interaction I have with the state that is not satisfactory, I'll just pick up the phone and call the hotline, uh, whatever they're there. So um, I will end on that <laughs> very active note and hand it over to you, Jiraid. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists and the listeners and the participants uh, in, through uh, the uh, YouTube or the streamlining. Uh, let me uh, make a comment uh, and we can then end it. The last question, what is necessary for the revolution to succeed? There, it, it may have a number of uh, uh, answers and some of the answers were given here. But uh, let me uh, say this about the revolution itself. The revolution did not address uh, foreign policy issues. The revolution did not start, did not, uh, while it was happening and before and, and since then, it did not address uh, the question of the conflict. The, my impression is uh, that the government now thinks that there's time to resolve it. It can wait. Uh, we've waited so long and nothing has happened. So we can wait more until we become 
economically stronger, democratically stronger, etc. And I think that um, uh, that is a big mistake. I personally do not think that this revolution or any revolution in the long run will succeed in doing what it claims it wanted to do without a resolution of that conflict, the Garapa conflict, or at least serious progress in its resolution. The conflict saps at the financial, social, political energies in seen and unseen ways. The conflict is not dead. It will flare up every few years, if not in big ways, at least in small ways, and it will divert the attention. The reason why Kocharyan and Serge Sarkisyan were autocratic and, and what they were was not only because they were bad people, but because they used the conflict in order to establish their personal rule, oligarchic system, undemocratic practices, all in the name of the nation's security. A securitized country that needs to keep a huge army, spend huge amounts to rearm and modernize its armies, will have limited resources, in my view, to take care of the other issues, including getting judges who are paid enough, policemen who are paid enough, teachers who are paid enough, and the young minds who have jobs and can do. Every new government that has come into play in Armenia, uh, the, uh, the Derbedrosian administration after the ceasefire, Kocharyan, Serge Sarkisyan, has marked economic progress, indices that indicate progress, but then all of that has stopped at some point. Every revolution, Pashinyan came to power to end corruption, but what happened when corruption reached the army? They said, we can't touch the army because it is security, because we have a war. We can't corrupt, clean the army, we cannot clean corruption in Armenia. It's as simple as that. It permeates life. It has the largest budget of any department. It will continue to get more and more. Conflicts between prime ministers and ministers has been on the basis of how to divide up what budget we have. This has happened in the past, it will happen now. And, and I personally do not think that there will be a finished revolution, a successful one, if we're not taking this conflict seriously. And the more we wait, the weaker we will be, not stronger considering demography, considering budgets, considering the limitations on economic development, uh, we will continue to be in trouble. And I may add, I've said this to my friend, Nigor Pashin, as prime minister, I've made it clear that I do not think that it will be possible. It, we will start, bidi garank, and we will be lame and we will be unfinished like the first revolution was unfinished. Pedros, all yours. Thank you very much, everyone. Exciting, illuminating panel, panelists. Thank you, Professor Libaridian, Ohanian, Ishanian, Paturian, and Kochikian for this, for this excellent presentations. It's a lively discussion we had, and uh, hopefully we, we will continue the discussion. I mean, the post-revolution period is is, is rife with uh, different conflicts. And uh, there are many aspects and we can do 20 or 30 panels of different aspects of the post-revolution period and the future of Armenia as uh, Libarigian raised uh, now. The, we, we haven't discussed foreign policy in general in this panel today. So, and the diaspora, we haven't dis discussed the diaspora aspect too. Hopefully these would be subjects for future panels that some of you or others can also participate Thank you for the attendees. Uh, uh, thank you for the questions from the audience and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.